Ahoy hoy, everybody. Welcome to the Talking Simpsons uh, Patreon interview show. We don't have a really good name for this yet, but uh, this is sort of our space to interview people associated with animation. I mean, this is not just a Simpsons Patreon. It is also an animation Patreon. And Henry's here as well. Hello, Henry. Hey, it's me too. Yeah, we, you know, we obviously have that goal of the animation conversation show and start that. Yeah. But in general, we want this to be more of a celebration of animation. And so we reached out to somebody who turns out is also a listener of of the show too. actually henry did all the work so please thank henry uh, nicely he set all of this up and um it turned out really well this uh next is a conversation with ian jones cordy so just a quick setup for him if you don't know him he first of all the creator of okko this new show currently on cartoon network which i am loving it is such a funny exciting show it's really I, fun to watch it's funny and it's very visually inventive and interesting yeah but he also has a ton of other experience too that he worked on he had worked on steven universe he was was a former executive producer on that he was the animation director on venture brothers which honestly if i run we're recording this after the interview uh-huh. there's one regret i did not ask him enough about venture brothers but there's only an hour he's done like, too many things I know. he's younger than me <laughs> yes and he worked on adventure time which we don't really touch on either right but but he's also a big time like gamer animation fan simpsons fan anime like, fan anime fan yeah. so we have a lot in common with him as like basically go- nerds who grew up in the 90s <laughs> nerds who grew up in the 90s and love very similar things yes Stuff. yeah and it was great to dig into this with him he's he's such a cool guy so yeah i guess uh listen and enjoy Uh, well, hey there, Ian. Hey, I first wanted to ask, I see a lot of influence from your childhood in OKKO, OK so I was curious, like, what was it like to be a nerdy kid growing up in the 90s? <laughs> I I don't know. I think it was a really great time. Uh, like, all, you know, uh, I think I was really lucky. Definitely people of my generation were really lucky to live through the, like, rapid development of video games. Um, mm-hmm. Like, getting to see... Like, I, I feel kind of sorry for kids who didn't get to see, like, have the, like, 2600 be their first system mm-hmm. and be, like, everything, like, grow and change overnight and, like, you know, get a Super Nintendo and a Sega Genesis and think, wow, it's never going to get better than this. <laughs> and then just see, like, you know, everything open up, see, like, you know, more developers and more, like, to where we are, like, at this time, it seems like the most amazing time for video games and cartoons and you know we've seen media become like so much more like niche and i don't know i I think it's i think it's just amazing like uh as a kid like i got cartoon network when it like started and like that was like a huge huge deal for me to just have like wow there's a cable channel that shows nothing but cartoons all day I don't know. It was it was great. Yeah, I I remember too. I had that same thing of like, wow, this could be Penelope pit stop <laughs> straight yeah. into her wacky wa- races. I will watch it all day. Yeah, I yeah. think um, being obsessed with things in the '90s might have been more gratifying because you had you had to go out and, and personally seek out all the information yourself, like That's you know true. collecting tapes of shows. Now I turn on a streaming network and there's like 300 episodes of an anime, and I'm like, ah, right. oh, this is too much immediately. <laughs> It's like it's it's so fun because like yeah when I go back and like watch old like Mystery Science Theater three thousand episodes it's sort of like how did they allow this to be on TV <laughs> and then you just you just remember that like oh these cable networks are new they had like no programming like a show like this could thrive at that time like I feel really lucky to have lived through that. Well, you talked about video games. I uh, We just did a whole Retronauts on Yoshi's Island, and I know you said that's been like a huge influence in you in general. Like, oh, what, yeah. What's so special about that, that game to you? So, yeah, for me, I mean, I don't know how blasphemous this is going to sound, but it feels like Nintendo's last super great 2D platformer. I, I feel like there's been like... You know, in, like, that classic era of Nintendo 2D platformers. Obviously, mm-hmm. they've, they've gone back and done things since. Like, you know, really good and amazing stuff. But it feels like it, feels like it was, like, the pinnacle of, you know, you had all these designers and all these artists, like, at the top of their game. Like, before they all sort of spread out and eventually, like, started uh, directing, like, their own games. 
Right. You know, it was it was like really important to me. Uh, and also, just as an artist, the uh, art style was a huge revelation for me because I had never uh, seen something that like the way that uh, form and function worked in that game. So like, you know, they had like the kind of with all the sprite rotations and, and scaling and stuff. So it gave everything this kind of chunky, pixelated kind of feel. And so they took that and kind of made that like the entire aesthetic of the game. There's something that's really uh, gratifying about that to me. And it's something that I've, I've tried to uh, sort of echo uh, in OKKO OK where, you know, because the show is hand animated, we work with the animation studio really closely and all the designers. We've given them this edict to, to keep the drawings in pencil. Mm. So they kind of have this like rough, sketchy sort of outline to them. So there's like a little noise and a little like grit to all of the lines. Like it doesn't feel super polished and super smooth. And I think that's something that I really uh, learned from Yoshi's Island, like studying the uh, aesthetic style of that game. That actually ties into a question about the animation of OKKO. I really wanted to ask, as someone who's obsessed with animation, but maybe not clear on all the granular elements of it, I was very impressed by how a digital show could emulate the sort of warmth and physicality of uh, classic cell animation. Can you go into um, the challenges of that? Is that necessarily a more expensive process than sort of the um, the other digital shows that just feel like there are established shapes that are sort of just moved around, not individual drawings for every frame of the show. Well, yeah, uh, thanks so much. Uh, that was definitely a goal of mine. You know, uh, before I get into the, the production thing of it, uh, like, you know, I mentioned Yoshi's Island, but also... A huge one of my influences is uh, Simpsons, especially like much earlier Simpsons. Mm. Uh, season one, actually, in particular, like it's a, something that a lot of people like look at season one and they're like, oh, it's so weird. It's not really the show. But to me, it's like it's so charming. Like this, it's got this like roughness and grit to it. And it's something that I really wanted to um, kind of call back to and make sure that the show had this like lively feeling so that like you never in your head forget that oh these are drawings these are funny drawings these are funny expressions they're like weird drawings like stuff like that but to sort of go into kind of like the feel of the show so yeah i had this um i had this goal of kind of trying to make the show feel yeah warm and kind of retro in that way i think the interesting thing about a lot of animation you know there are shows that we know, like, say, like, Rick and Morty or BoJack Horseman that are, like, they're done in Flash. The animation is done by people, but it's um, it's drawn directly into the computer. And so you get a lot of, like, asset reuse and sort of, like, the feel of something moving. Move, when something moves around, a lot of times it's, like, the same image sort of being puppeted around. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that's actually... It's a really effective technique, uh, especially for, like, those shows where, like, the characters are sort of supposed to keep this sort of, like, flat consistency to them. And uh, I think that's definitely one way to go. However, on all the shows I've worked on, we've gone sort of another way. So, for instance, Adventure Time, which I worked on, Steven Universe, which I also worked on, The Venture Brothers, which uh, that's one of my, was one of my first jobs in animation as an animation director, and my show... Uh, are all animated traditionally. So instead of um, using flash and sort of puppeting uh, drawings around, every single every single movement, every single frame is drawn by an animator. So you know, even though basically even though they look slick, like something like Adventure Time or Steven Universe, people believe that oh, are these like vector lines? Mm. Are these like flash animated drawings? They're not. <laughs> In fact. Uh, Steven, it, it, it takes, like, a lot of work to get that sort of line consistency. Steven Universe, like, I've been in Korea, and I've watched these artists, like, ink these drawings, and it is the most incredible thing you've ever seen. You would think that a machine, no one could do, like, it with that high level of skill, but these are all, like, hand-drawn, hand-inked drawings. Wow. Um, and sort of my, one of the things I wanted to do was really highlight that. And so when, it, when talking with the animation studios and also my pre-production team, I've sort of, um, we've sort of, I've had like the creative edict of, hey, let's never forget that these are drawings. Make mm. sure that you have the feel of like the hand-drawn, like hand-inked line in there. 
And so it came down to even, let's just do the entire show in pencil. And basically what they do is they animate all of the layouts and animation in pencil, like traditionally, like on a light table for everything. In fact, uh, like on my, I tweeted like uh, months ago, like an uh, image of like uh, someone flipping like one of my scenes, like on paper, you know, they, these are like, this is done like the old school way. Hmm. And basically awesome. what they do is they, they take those drawings, scan those drawings, and they color them in this process where they keep the line work, the rough line work on top, and they sort of color the spaces under it. So it has like, you know, this sort of bright colored in feel, but it retains like that hand drawn line. Uh, you know, you mentioned The Simpsons. So, yeah, I was going to ask if you were a Simpsons fan growing up that the stuff about the animation, it's something I kind of wish I'd focused on a little more earlier on the show that Bob and I are writers, I think. So maybe we come at it of just like, oh, the writers who wrote the show and then it gets animated. <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah. but like so but, had, did it have influence on you as an animator, The Simpsons? I, I would guess it did. Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, I do. <laughs> There's something that I've done like throughout my career. So, you know, I'll sit down and I'll, I'll marathon the Simpsons. Basically I'll do like one through nine or, or one through eight and half of nine. Uh, <laughs> and I will basically like, I will go back every couple of years and do that. The things that I've learned throughout my career and how to put a show together and how to make a show really changes the way that I look at certain episodes and certain uh, the way that I look at certain sequences in The Simpsons. Like, for instance, I don't know, I would say Itchy and Scratchy and Marge. Amazing episode, all about animation, something I really like. The sequence in that show where um, all the kids, because they don't like the show anymore, they go outside and play. Um, <laughs> like, watching a sequence like that, it had an effect on me. And I was like, wow, this is really well animated, really well done. I watch it now and I'm like looking at all the layouts that they did, like all the like awesome camera cheats that they did to like affect things. There's like these incredible bypack shots where they're using foreground elements, wiping the screen, and then they cut to like a different layout of all the characters doing something. Like it, there's like some really like technically impressive like animation in that show. Um, and it was something that was like a huge, huge, huge influence on me. It was one of my, it was one of my big influences. I mean, along with Ren and Stimpy and Dexter's Lab, but like, uh, that, yeah, it was huge for me. Yeah. I remember that like super long panning shot where they kind of hide, like they hide one cut between a frisbee like a frisbee will cover yeah. the screen and, yeah uh, that was uh, a jim reardon episode he's a master class animator yeah he's, i mean yeah. He, he's amazing yeah yeah all right also that episode is it true that pies are easy to draw or are yeah. they easier to draw than ice cream <laughs> i mean i feel like that's kind of just a, a writer joke yes uh, <laughs> yeah i don't know we we did an episode with a pie fight at the end and it oh, was yeah. super fun so i don't know maybe they're right <laughs> uh going back a little bit to games like were you more of a sonic or mario guy well uh, man i loved both growing up however when it so when it came to 16-bit uh actually as as a kid super mario brothers 3 was like my favorite game mm -hmm. and it, it's still like one of my favorites but at 16-bit controversially i i got a genesis instead of a super nintendo yes. uh, my friend <laughs> Because my friends owned Super Nintendo, so I always felt like, well, I could play that over at their house if I want to. But I feel like I grew up sort of appreciating both. I know that there's this, like, Sonic Mario dichotomy, but I think a lot of that comes from people who played Super Mario World and loved it, and then they played Sonic, and then they were like, hey, this isn't Super Mario World. This, mm -hmm. this is bad. <laughs> and then they just were like... You know, they just are like, and that's why there's all these like <laughs> articles and think pieces like Sonic was always bad. And it's usually from like a point of view where they're like, well, it wasn't Mario, so I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always, like, to me, I guess I always saw them as two different games with completely different aims. So, uh, yeah, I really loved both of them. And I, I loved like the art style of, of classic Sonic and classic Mario. Those were like huge influences on me just like the clear silhouettes the clear like lines the like very expressive cartooning of those characters and mm -hmm. what's interesting is that like limitations of those systems like made them have to be like 
more deliberate and more clear with like their cartooning of those characters. And I, th- I think it really pays off. And, and I know you were involved a little bit with the Sonic Mania animated opening. Like that yeah, thing, <laughs> that thing yeah, was, was so gorgeous. I, cause I always thought, well, the best animated Sonic will always be the Sonic CD opening. Oh, yeah. But yeah. then I saw the Mania opening. I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> this is, this oh, is even- when, when I was a kid. I I didn't have a Sega CD original. I eventually bought one, but uh, mm. I didn't have one. And I was in, I think, like Radio Shack or like Sears Funtronics, and they had one. And I saw that intro, and and it wasn't the Sega CD that they had hooked up had no controllers, so they were just playing the Sonic CD attract mode on loop. Wow, what a tease! And <laughs> I just like sat there and watched it over and over and over. And I was like, this is my life. This is like the greatest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and it inspired so much of like my work. I was, I was constantly trying to animate something that cool. Mm. And then, um, yeah, I just happened to have through animation connections. I just happened to have some friends who were involved in the production on the Sonic Mania intro. And they reached out to me and you know, I'm running an animated TV show, so I, I have like no time. I have uh, like my I'm, my schedule is so busy. Like I have like no time to like work on personal work or anything else. But they approached me and they're like, "Hey, we're doing this uh, Sonic intro. Like, do you think you could animate a couple shots?" And I was just like, "I will clear my schedule. I will do whatever it takes. <laughs> I'll cancel my like, show." So- to me yeah so i ended up animating two shots for that intro and it was like it was a dream come true i did want to talk about the uh the influence anime has had on you because i feel like we're now just starting to get into an era in which creators are now deeply influenced by anime instead of you know people saying well i guess the kids like anime let's make our show look like that can you talk about the titles you liked and sort of just how you appreciate the craftsmanship and the the style yeah yeah let me see gosh I would say, like, super early on, like, the things that had, like, big influences on me were, well, I would say some of my hugest influences would be, like, Project Aiko. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yep. In, just just mind-blowing to me, seeing that kind of action. Definitely, like, a lot of the classics. Ninja Scroll was <laughs> huge in my childhood. I, I played that over and over. Uh, Evangelion uh, was, like, just like one of those like early teenage uh, mind blow kind of like oh my gosh like uh, a cartoon can do this like I'm I'm so smart now you know <laughs> yeah. um, just like reading a book yeah exactly but one of my one of my hugest influences actually is a uh, early uh, Miyazaki series called uh, Future Boy Conan oh yeah um, yeah Future Boy Conan is like it's a, it's just like one of the best animes i've ever watched um it's basically so he uh this was post uh the second series of loop on the third miyazaki uh directed a couple episodes of that Mm -hmm. um and he eventually had his own series which i think was uh aired on i think it was maybe like a public television network in japan at the time and he directed the series he directed all of the episodes i think except for two uh that uh that i think maybe uh, I don't want to misattribute who who did that, but uh, mm. he directed all the episodes in this in this show. And if you like the uh, Miyazaki film Castle in the Sky, you'll love this show, uh, uh, Laputa. Uh, this show is like that, but kind of blown out over twenty six episodes. It's got everything that I think is really cool. It's got planes, of mechs. course. It's got uh, it's got a super strong kid who like does all this really amazing action. It's got, like, the pure love of children, which is, like, the best thing in, like, a Miyazaki thing, Mm -hmm. where it's just, like, you know, there's a boy and a girl, and they just love each other with no questions asked, and it's, like, they're risking their lives to, like, save each other, and, you know, it's just, like, mind-blowing and super fun. If you ever have a chance to watch Future Boy Conan, I would say uh, dig into it, because it's, like, it's one of my favorite Miyazaki things, you know, that and... That and Porco Rosa. Yeah, I've always been meaning to. It's been it's been hard to see, and it's never been officially localized in the U.S. I think. I but yeah, after yeah. I after I watched Nadia's Secret of Blue Water and uh. then saw clips of shots from Future Boys, like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that that anime influence too, I could definitely see on the show. One of my favorite moments of that was in TKO when you guys had the eye catches, especially with the like not for resale Chiron yeah. just on the screen. That was That's so great. funny. And when characters are introduced, you see all the text pop into the screen that describe yeah. who they are and their powers and their level and things. I just I love that so much in anime. It's great to see it in your show. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, I would say like I'm you know, and it kind of goes along with that sort of the thing the observation you mentioned bob is uh, about sort of trying to emulate that warmth and uh feeling of like it being like a lazy saturday afternoon and you're just watching like some old cartoons or anime or something uh and and i like to like put in things that like just take you back uh, to that sort of feeling and create that feeling for kids who never got to experience it. So I did want to ask about guest stars on the show have just been like amazing to me, especially when I uh, don't even recognize them at first and then see it in the, the credits like uh, Keith David, Marina Sirtis, LeVar Burton, like Carol Kane. Yeah. And and the biggest one to me was like when I saw that uh, Jonathan Davis yes. of porn yeah. was on the show, I was like... like how do you go about getting those kind of guest stars? What's your what's your approach to casting for that kind of stuff? Well, I think, you know, it's something that we sort of all talk about as a crew. When How we make the shows is, you know, we basically, um, the board artists get a outline and then they draw a storyboard and then they pitch it to the room and we all kind of talk about it. I mean, this is like, this is the way they pitch Hanna-Barbera cartoons and Disney cartoons and Warner Brothers cartoons. It's a very like old school process. We basically sit in a room, we look at all the jokes, we try and figure out like what's funny and stuff. In that process, like when you're pitching, you know, to sell like your jokes, you do different voices for all of the characters as you're as you're selling the jokes. A lot of times like we get hung up on a character and be like, oh my gosh, like what a funny character, what a funny uh, voice that would be. Like, do we know any actors who could do that? And in the case of someone like Jonathan Davis, that was, uh, so that was uh, in an episode called Know Your Mom that was storyboarded by Parker Simmons and Ryan Shannon. And part of the idea about that episode was um, we were like, oh, we're going to bring back one of, one of K.O.'s mom's old villains. And then we thought about like, you know, oh, well, what would an old villain be like in the, in, the show's current year and so we were like what if it was like an early 2000s rap rock new metal guy <laughs> and after they pitched it it was hilarious and then we were like what if we actually got someone to do that and we just we literally just reached out to jonathan davis personally and he was super into it and the record was hilarious like he he just like Every time he looked at the script, he started laughing. Like, oh, my God. Like, do you want me to sing this? Because this is one of my songs. Like, you know, it was just like, it was really great. That's, he was super sweet. That's awesome. You know, that moment for me watching it was a kind of like, oh, I'm that old moment of, I felt like, <laughs> oh, yeah, if I had a kid who was 6 to 11, like KO is, then yeah. my... Uh, that would be the ancient past to that kid. I was like, oh my gosh, that that, that would be that long ago. <laughs> it was crazy to me. Yeah, we had that moment of being like, oh, well, if it's an old villain, like, I guess if it was, say, like, I don't know, a show in the 90s, and they wanted someone to look outdated, they would do like, I don't know, like a disco joke or something yeah. like that, you know? But I think, like, we have to do something different because, yeah, it's current year. It needs to be Jinko jeans instead of <laughs> bell bottoms. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you are a voice actor on the show, which you hadn't really done on the previous shows you'd you'd worked on. So what's what's it been like to be to be a regular voice on on the series yourself, including scenes where you're like, say, Rad is talking to Daryl. In, in yeah. <laughs> So I kind of like fell backwards into doing the voice. It was literally because on the pilot, you know, we, you know, pilots are kind of fly by night mm -hmm. sort of things. And we have to, you have to just get stuff done like as soon as possible. So I was just like, you know what, I'll just do these voices. If I ever make it a show, I'll, I'll cast someone else or I don't know. And then it just kind of stuck. And then we were never able to like do cast someone else or do anything else. So <laughs> I ended up like just staying on and doing the voices. Voice acting is like, it's strenuous, tough work, but I like it because um, I have a lot of responsibility throughout the day to make decisions and create stuff and like make calls on 
you know, design, storyboard, stories, like everything. Like voice acting is kind of like one of the times during the day where I'm behind, I'm in a booth and someone else is telling me what to do. <laughs> like, it's really nice. Uh, the best thing about voice acting, though, has been gotten to sit in the booth next to, like, some of, like, my voice acting heroes. Like, not only if, do I get to work every week with Courtney Taylor and Ashley Birch, who are amazing mm-hmm. voice actresses who have done, like, several video games and cartoons and amazing, like, amazing work. But then also, like, I get to be in the booth and with Jim Cummings, who is, like, one yeah. of my voice acting, like... Like, this is, like, uh, uh, God to me, basically, like, in terms of, like, I mean, he can do anything. Like, and, like, when I do a line and Jim Cummings or, say, like, Dave Herman, who, who also does, like, a lot of voices on the show, when I do a line and one of them looks over and is like, hey, good job on that. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. How intimidating. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, that, uh, it, it's awesome. That Jim Cummings thing. That the second I heard Boxman's voice yeah. in his first appearance, I was like, oh my god, this is the per- it. It was just perfection to me because he he is one of the all time greats. Like he is like, uh, it's hard to say he's the. I don't want to demean other voice actors from our childhood, sure. but he was like my favorite. He was like the Mel Blank to me. All us when I realized, oh, yeah. like, oh wait, Darkwing duck is also winnie the pooh is also tigger is also like he's all these characters pete, yeah pete, he's yeah. pete yeah he's, he's so different pete, yeah uh, he's, and he's like scar's singing voice in line yes yeah, yeah that like, well, jeremy that, irons couldn't do it <laughs> well he blew out his voice well, oh yeah but, but yeah the so i it yeah the casting of jim cummings like well, that had to be pretty early in the decision for him to do his villain dude voice right yeah um in in the pilot so i made the pilot uh for okko it was called lakewood plaza turbo in 2011 and 2012 and um i did have some scenes where lord boxman appeared and uh but unfortunately it's a pilot it's only seven minutes i had to cut it down so i didn't get to reach out to him but uh, later on, uh, when we were doing our first mobile game and then doing the first short, I got to reach out to him. He was super, he was super into it. He just came in. He he was he's an incredible professional, and like he just like exudes this like uh, his line reads are so confident and so fun mm-hmm. and so full of energy. Um, it's, for me, it, it it I'm like this is a thing that I made so. I'm like, is this legitimate in any way? And then hearing his <laughs> voice coming out of the characters, I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's a real cartoon. Yeah, actually, uh, Jim Cummings is from my hometown, and growing up in the 90s, every kid uh, claimed to be related to him in some way. It's like, okay, he can't be everybody's uncle. Let's settle down here. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Captain Planet episode uh, just aired, and that was that was a great one. I I especially love you know you got back the uh, Lavar Burton and the original voice of Captain Planet, and I especially love like Lavar Burton's readings in it. Or so he's like, oh no, like it's like yeah. it's such an innocence to it. I really like that. But then it ends on I I also just love the ending. It's just like a like bam, slap you in the face, like. Oh, the world's... We're doomed! (laughs) Yeah, uh, that was super fun to do because, yeah, uh, so I wanted to do this Captain Planet uh, crossover. Uh, Yeah, it's easy, I guess, because I work for Turner and they also own Captain Planet. And, you know, I approached it from, you know, I didn't want to actually, like, make fun of Captain Planet. I wanted to do something genuine and Mm -hmm. something that would fit in with, like, the actual goals of it. And part of that was, yeah getting those original voice actors back working with them was was incredible working with uh working with lavar was awesome as soon as he got back into the um into the booth like instantly like kwame's voice came out and he even sort of like took his own spin on some of the lines and <laughs> like you know it, it was like hearing that that character come to life again and it, it was amazing to meet him because he was a huge inspiration uh, to me, as a young nerdy Trekkie who loved reading, uh, <laughs> you know. um, but one of the best things about the Captain Planet uh, episode was so Captain Planet's voice, David Coburn, is uh, he really he really embodies that character, and 
he also really believes in like the ideals that uh, that original show was setting forth. And when he saw the original script, that end sort of sermon that Kwame and Captain Planet give, he actually like when we were doing the record, he worked with us to make sure that, you know, it was very genuine. Mm. That, you know, the thing about Captain Planet as a show is that, yes, it was this cheesy show, but it was never afraid to drop, like, hard truths about, you know, how bad things have gotten in the world and, like, you know, how, like, if we don't pay attention to our environment, like, you know, we, we there are going to be, like, real problems. And, like, one of the things that he helped us uh, balance was, you know, in the original show, there was always this balance of, hard truth, but then actionable steps and optimism so that there's ways that even you as a kid can feel involved in the fight for the planet. And uh, so he really brought that to that, uh, to that final bit in the show, which was like, you know, he, he helped us like sort of craft those lines where it's like, he, he says the hard truth, but he's like, hey, but if we work together today, we can still have a brighter future. And that was something that was really important to me. So before uh, we let you go, I have one uh, question for you about a really obscure reference I spotted when I just started watching the show. I was extremely surprised and delighted to see just an explicit Clash at Demon Head reference in OKKO. OK and I want to know if you have any idea what I'm talking about. Oh, <laughs> are you talking about the character, a real magic skeleton? It looks a little like Tom Guycott. Yes, and actually, I noticed Go. If you, <laughs> if you squint, the protagonist is sort of like a squashed down version of the of the protagonist in Clash of Demon Head. I was like, oh my god, somebody yeah. else has played Clash of Demon Head, and they recognize how cool Tom Guycott is. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah that that was another that was a game uh, that I played like super early uh, as a kid, and I always, you know, it, I think it was a thing that like I didn't have a manual for that game or anything, so like I was just kind of like I was just kind of making it up in my head. Like, yeah. who are these characters? Like, what is this world? Like, it's so crazy to me. And yeah, that was that was that was something that was definitely an influence. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess a, a last question for me. You know, the show's now aired uh, uh, over thirty episodes, and seems like it's really chugging along. Like with these later episodes in in this run, like what have you guys learned from the beginning of the show that you're you've put into action in these more recent episodes? So yeah, what's been one of the most fun things about the process has been so. You know, these are characters that I've um, been working on since 2011. Uh, th these are characters that I've, you know, I've, I've had for a while. And, you know, they've become sort of real to me. And uh, when we're working on the show, uh, it's really it's really awesome that, uh, like, when we come up with a new story or a new situation, the characters almost are like they feel like they're alive like we know what they're going to do and we understand what their chemistry is and we have a lot of fun like just throwing the characters at a situation and seeing like the fun ways that uh they would approach it one of like my best um experiences on the show is going into a pitch and thinking like oh ko would do this and then the board artist is like actually ko would probably say this because <laughs> he feels this way. And I would be like, Oh yeah, I guess you're right. Like the characters begin to have a life of their own. And, uh, sort of as the show goes on, we have a lot more fun with that. And also sort of dipping into the, uh, characters backstories and their motivations and sort of, uh, you know, having fun with the fact that it's like this big interconnected world of heroes and villains. That's something that, yeah, we go into a lot more. Well, all right. Well, we kept you long enough, Ian. Thank you so much for yeah, your time. Thank it you was so much. It's so Ian. awesome to talk to you about all this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And hey, uh, you know, in the future, I would, I would love to talk to you guys again. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Retronauts and Talking Simpsons. Uh, you know, wow, I'd, be, I'd, be down, I'd be down for all that stuff. If you ever someday get around to a talking KO, I would totally get <laughs> that on That could be in our future. <laughs> that very well could be. Oh, man. Well, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ian. Oh, 
man, I want to thank Ian Jones Quarty so much for his time. Uh, that is our interview with him, though that is the regular edition of it. We actually have a longer special edition of it up on our Patreon. Uh, just if you're a new listener here, I just want to let you guys know that Bob and me, along with Chris Antista, every week do a Talking Simpsons podcast where we go through every episode of The Simpsons chronologically. And the way we're able to do that is because Bob and myself do this full-time thanks to being fully funded by patreon and that is on patreon.com slash talking simpsons so if you want to check that out we go a little bit more into ian's influences and his love of old video games all that stuff we talk a bit more on that it's about 20 minutes longer but but we want to give you guys this awesome talk we had with ian again a super duper thank you to ian jones corny for doing this interview we really, really appreciate it. He's, uh, I, I seriously do love OKKO. Okay it's one of my new favorite shows. And everything that Ian has worked on, I have been a huge fan of. So this was such an honor to get to talk to him. OKKO, okay it airs on Cartoon Network. It's on the Cartoon Network app. You can get it on the digital storefronts like Amazon and iTunes and all that stuff. It's, it's super easy to get access to. I'm usually waiting with beta breath for every new episode. So be sure to check those out too. And again, the extended interview is on our Patreon and you can check that out at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Sign up to listen for yourself. And thank you very much for joining us. Bye. All right, I'm bored. Everybody out. Oh, oh, <laughs> I'm a bad rock.